SpaceX just made a move so insane that NASA engineers are calling it impossible. After 500 plus perfect landings, they're killing landing zone one, their most successful pad ever. But here's the kicker. They're doing this right as they plan to launch 120 rockets per year. What secret technology forced this shocking decision? Let's dive right in. Friday, 11.43 a.m. Eastern, Crew-11 blasts off from Kennedy Space Center, looking like just another routine ISS mission. Four astronauts, standard Dragon capsule, same launch pad NASA's used for decades. But 8.8 .8 miles away, SpaceX engineers were already dismantling equipment they'd never use again. The Falcon 9 booster touched down at landing zone one with surgical precision. It's 500th perfect landing at this legendary site. The crowd cheered. NASA celebrated another flawless mission. But what they didn't know was that they just witnessed the funeral of the most successful landing pad in space history. Why would SpaceX destroy their golden goose at the peak of its success? Here's the problem that's been driving NASA engineers crazy for months. SpaceX just filed paperwork to launch 120 Falcon 9 rockets per year from Cape Canaveral. That's not a typo. 120 launches from a single location. To put this in perspective, the entire world launched 186 rockets in 2022. SpaceX wants to launch 120 from one facility. The logistics are insane. Every single landing at LZ-1 creates a nightmare. SpaceX has to transport a 15-story rocket booster across 8.8 .8 miles of Florida highways, through traffic, past curious onlookers, back to the launch complex for refurbishment. That's 120 massive transport operations per year, 120 opportunities for delays, 120 chances for catastrophic failure. But the real kicker? Each landing creates sonic booms that rattle windows for miles. Local residents were already complaining at 50 launches per year. What happens when that number more than doubles? According to insider sources, the breakthrough came during a classified SpaceX meeting in late 2024. Engineers were stuck on the transport problem when someone asked a simple question. What if we didn't need landing zone one at all? The room went silent. LZ-1 was SpaceX's crown jewel, their proof of concept, their tourist attraction. But then someone pulled up Starship's Mechazilla tower design and everything clicked. What if every Falcon 9 could launch and land on the same pad? What if they could eliminate the 8.8 .8 mile nightmare entirely? What if turnaround times dropped from weeks to hours? NASA engineers called it technically impossible. The precision required to land a rocket on its launch pad seemed beyond current technology. But SpaceX had been secretly testing something that would make that assessment look foolish. Here's what SpaceX developed in complete secrecy. A guidance system so precise it can land a 15-story rocket on a platform the size of a basketball court after traveling through space. We're talking about accuracy that makes Olympic marksmen look clumsy. But guidance was just the beginning. The real breakthrough was infrastructure redesign. SpaceX quietly retrofitted their launch pads to handle both launches and landings. New blast deflectors capable of withstanding multiple rocket engines. Reinforced concrete rated for impacts that would destroy normal structures. Advanced fire suppression systems that activate in milliseconds. They essentially built two facilities in one and nobody noticed. Here's something that didn't make headlines. SpaceX has already been testing return to launch site landings at their private facilities in Texas. Not at Cape Canaveral, that would have tipped their hand, but at remote test sites, they've been perfecting this technology for over a year. The results were staggering. Turnaround times dropped from two to three weeks to just 72 hours. Transportation costs eliminated, logistics headaches gone, Risk of highway accidents, zero. Suddenly, 120 launches per year didn't seem impossible. It seemed inevitable. Now here's the twist that proves this was all orchestrated. SpaceX could have easily landed that Crew-11 booster back at the launch site. They had the technology. They had clearance. The weather was perfect. But they chose LZ-1 for one final performance. Why? Because they wanted the world to witness the end of an era. They wanted the contrast to be crystal clear. Old way versus new way, transportation versus efficiency, past versus future. It was pure theater, 
and every space agency in the world fell for it. That new FAA rule requiring return to launch site landings? SpaceX didn't just influence that regulation, they essentially wrote it. They've been lobbying behind the scenes for months, arguing that centralized operations are safer, more efficient, and better for communities. The FAA agreed, but with one condition, prove the technology works flawlessly. Crew 11's mission was the final validation test. The moment that booster touched down at LZ-1, the old system's fate was sealed. Here's another piece that makes perfect sense now. SpaceX's lease for landing zones one and two expires in July, 2025. That's less than 12 months away. Renewal would cost millions. Upgrading for increased traffic would cost tens of millions more. Instead of throwing money at outdated infrastructure, SpaceX chose to revolutionize their entire operation. Why pay rent when you can own the future? This transformation isn't really about Falcon 9. It's preparation for Starship. Every return to launch site landing is training for Mars missions where there are no backup landing sites, no transport trucks, no second chances. Mechazilla's catch and release system represents the ultimate evolution. Launch and land on the same tower. Zero transportation time, instant refueling capability, hour-long turnarounds between flights. By mastering this with Falcon 9, SpaceX is building the operational expertise they'll need when humans depend on Starship for survival on Mars. Look at SpaceX's trajectory. Over 500 successful landings have given them unmatched expertise in rocket recovery. Landing Zone 1 served its purpose, proving reusability was possible. But Mars colonization requires something more. Proving rapid reusability is practical. With return-to-launch site operations, SpaceX could theoretically launch the same booster multiple times per week. That's not speculation. That's their actual roadmap for making Mars affordable. Other rocket companies are watching this transformation with terror. SpaceX isn't just improving efficiency. They're making competition economically impossible. When your turnaround time is measured in days instead of months, when your operational costs plummet by 90%, when your launch capacity increases tenfold, you don't just win the market, you become the market. Blue Origin, ULA, and international competitors now face an impossible choice. Copy SpaceX's model or accept permanent irrelevance. Most lack the resources or expertise to build return-to-launch site capabilities. SpaceX has created a technological moat around the entire space industry. Here's what's really happening behind the scenes. SpaceX plans to complete their transition by late 2025. All Falcon 9 missions will launch and land at the same site. Landing Zone 2 will be decommissioned shortly after LZ-1. By 2026, Cape Canaveral will look completely different. But that's just Phase 1. Phase 2 involves integrating Starship operations. Phase 3? Insiders hint at launch rates that would make today's 120 mission goal look conservative. Ironically, killing landing zone one might be SpaceX's greatest environmental achievement. No more transport trucks burning fuel across Florida highways. No more separate facilities requiring power and maintenance. No more redundant infrastructure. Consolidating operations doesn't just save money. It dramatically reduces SpaceX's carbon footprint per launch. Environmental groups who once protested sonic booms are now quietly supporting the change. NASA is publicly supportive, but privately concerned. They have spent years certifying Landing Zone 1 for crew missions. Now they have to recertify entirely new procedures. Safety reviews will take months. Paperwork will be mountainous. But NASA also knows they have no choice. SpaceX isn't just their contractor. They're the only path to reliable crew transportation. If SpaceX says the future is return to launch site, NASA has to follow or get left behind. The death of landing zone one isn't just about efficiency or cost savings. It's about SpaceX positioning themselves as the sole gateway to space for the next decade. Every other launch provider is now playing catch up to technology they didn't even know existed. And the most shocking part, this was never about Falcon 9 at all. It was always about proving the concepts needed for Mars. Everything, the precision landings, the rapid turnarounds, the infrastructure integration, is rehearsal for humanity's next giant leap. The question isn't whether SpaceX will dominate space transportation. 
The question is whether anyone else will still be in the game when they're done. Elon Musk just exposed a fatal flaw in SpaceX's Raptor engine. The same engine supposed to save humanity on Mars is secretly bleeding 5% of its power every single flight. But wait, engineers found something incredible. This flaw could actually unlock 5.3% more performance. How is that even possible? Let's dive right in. Here's what actually happened. Every Raptor engine that's ever launched has been deliberately sabotaging itself, and Musk knew it from day one. Let's start with something that'll blow your mind. The Raptor engine uses a full-flow stage combustion cycle, a technology so insanely difficult that it was considered impossible for decades. NASA tried it, the Russians tried it, everyone failed, until SpaceX didn't. But here's the crazy part. This impossible technology is exactly what's causing the 5% power loss. Those pre-burners I mentioned? There are literally many engines inside the main engine, burning fuel before it reaches the main chamber. It's like having two stomach acids digest your food before it gets to your actual stomach. Every rocket engineer on Earth told Musk this was stupid. Why would you want to burn your fuel twice? Why would you intentionally reduce your engine's power? But Musk had a different plan entirely. Here's what changes everything. Traditional rocket engines are like Formula One cars. Incredible performance, but they explode themselves after one race. The space shuttle's engines needed complete rebuilds between flights. Now imagine you're on Mars, 140 million miles from the nearest mechanic. Your Raptor engine fails. What do you do? Call AAA. This is why SpaceX made the most controversial engineering decision in rocket history. They deliberately crippled their engine to save it from itself. Those pre-burners that steal 5% of the power? They're actually cooling the engine down, reducing stress, extending its life. It's like choosing a Toyota over a Ferrari for a cross-country road trip. Less exciting, but you'll actually make it to your destination. But then SpaceX engineers discovered something that changed everything. Remember how I said the engine loses 5% of its power? Well, what if I told you they found a way to not just recover that power, but make the engine 5.3% more powerful than it would be without pre-burners? Here's how they did it. By adjusting the fuel mixture ratio from 1.11 to 1.4, something magical happens. The engine doesn't just compensate for the pre-burner losses. It actually becomes more efficient than a perfect engine would be. But wait, it gets weirder. You'd think more power means more heat, right? Wrong. At this optimized mixture, the temperature actually drops by 6.4%. It's like discovering that driving faster makes your car run cooler. This is where physics starts breaking down. But there's a catch that could destroy everything. At that magical 1.4 fuel ratio, the pressure inside the combustion chamber jumps by 5%. And this is where SpaceX hits a wall made of the laws of physics themselves. Current materials, even the most exotic metals on Earth can't handle much more pressure. SpaceX already uses Inconel, a super alloy that costs more per pound than gold. They even invented their own metal called SX500 that can withstand 800 atmospheres of pressure. To put that in perspective, the deepest part of the ocean only creates 110 atmospheres. SX500 can handle the pressure of eight kilometers of water pressing down on every square inch and it's still not enough for what they really want to do. While other companies are still machining parts like it's 1950, SpaceX is literally printing rocket engines. Not just small components, entire engine sections are being built layer by layer in 3D printers. This isn't just cool technology, it's strategic warfare. Traditional manufacturing takes months, 3D printing takes days. When you're trying to get to Mars before your competitors even figure out how to land a rocket, Speed isn't just an advantage, it's survival. But here's the part that should terrify every other rocket company. SpaceX can now integrate dozens of separate parts into a single printed component. Those complex cooling channels that used to require assembly of hundreds of pieces, now they're printed as one solid unit. Your competitors can't even see how you did it anymore. 
This is where the story gets absolutely insane. Remember that flying spaghetti monster, Raptor 1 with all its cables and complexity? It produced 1,700 kilonewtons of thrust. Raptor 2 jumped to 2,250 kilonewtons while cutting production costs in half. Impressive, but not shocking. Then came Raptor 3, and this is where physics starts crying. 2,800 kilonewtons of thrust. That's a 65% increase over the original. But here's the kicker. It's 36% lighter than Raptor 1. More power, less weight. That's not just improvement, that's magic. Look at this thing. It looks like someone stripped away everything unnecessary and left only the pure essence of rocket engine. It's so clean, so minimal, that when SpaceX first showed it, other rocket CEOs thought it was fake. But Musk isn't done. He's hinting at pushing beyond 3,000 kilonewtons. That's almost double the power of the original engine. Here's something most people completely miss. The Raptor can swivel 15 degrees in any direction. Doesn't sound like much? It's actually revolutionary. The Space Shuttle's engines maxed out at 12.5 degrees. Falcon 9's Merlin engines can only do 5 degrees. But Raptor's 15-degree range isn't just about steering. It's about surviving the impossible. When you're landing a 120-meter-tall skyscraper on a floating platform in choppy seas, or trying to catch it with mechanical arms moving at precisely the right moment, those extra degrees are the difference between success and a multi-billion dollar fireworks show. But the range isn't even the most impressive part. It's not just how far the Raptor can move, it's how fast it moves. During Starship landings, engines shut down one by one in a carefully choreographed sequence. The remaining engines have milliseconds to compensate. This happens while the entire rocket is experiencing massive G-forces, traveling at supersonic speeds, with the ground rushing up at hundreds of miles per hour. It's like performing heart surgery while riding a roller coaster during an earthquake. One small delay, one miscalculation, one engine that doesn't respond fast enough, and 33 crew members don't make it home from Mars. This is where the real battle is happening. Not in space, not on launch pads, but in metallurgy labs where SpaceX engineers are literally inventing new forms of matter. They've created alloys with names like 6500 that can survive conditions that would vaporize normal metals. These materials are so advanced, so proprietary, that SpaceX guards their composition like nuclear launch codes. But even these miracles